I do not want to comment. Je me suis donné toutes les réponses dont j'avais besoin. C'est la Fashion Week Ils se mettent sur le trottoir, les fashion What Hello, Elizabeth. Hi. Hi. Thanks for being with us. We're super honored to have you today. Thanks for having mm. me. <laughs> We're finishing the year with you. Um, so I don't know if you ever listen to the podcast. No. Okay. <laughs> so no, usually it's just like a conversation with between all of us. And uh, we usually start with like, where are you from? And like, how was your childhood, like school? And we just go from there till, uh, till now, <laughs> till the future <laughs> even. <laughs> so where were you? Were, where were you born? Where, where um, did you grow up? I uh, was born in uh, 1987 in Moscow, Russia, um, and I grew up in Moscow until I became 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, I grew up in a um, family of Russian Jews. Um, and so when there was a regime change and things became not so relaxed, uh, my parents realized that um, there is a... You know, there was there was a not so beautiful feeling anymore, and it seemed like things were getting very dark. It was so, time to move. Yeah, and and uh, we were lucky to be able to move to Germany because there was a reinvitation program for Jewish people. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was right after, um, right after Yeltsin uh, sort of gave up his reign. <laughs> okay. So you were you were not speaking German or anything? N well, I I went to school uh, for German for a year before we left, and mm. uh, uh, when I came to Germany, it I thought that it would be not so problematic, uh, but but then it was <laughs> because uh, because I didn't just go to Germany. I went to Bavaria, and Bavarians have their own uh, very own way of speaking German, mm -hmm. and I found myself very unadapted to the situation. Um, but to the situation in general, because I wasn't prepared um, physically, I wasn't prepared mentally. I um, went to a very, you know, I went to a public school, but it still was a posh school. Um, people mm -hmm. uh, holding little Chanel bags and wow. driving oh, wow. Porsches to, to the to the gateway. And uh, um, your family background is not as posh, I'm guessing, then. Um, we are, I would say we come from intelligentsia. We, mm. It's very educated. Everyone is an academic. Um, yeah. My grandfather was um, a, an astrophysicist. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and um, my, both my parents are um, university teachers and uh, scientists in their respective fields. So I would say that the, <laughs> the money was in the education. Um, that's how I always felt. But in terms of actual, you know, like, yeah, um, rich bitch <laughs> sort of thing, <laughs> that that was not a that thing. That was not you. <laughs> no. Um, so um, I wasn't I wasn't in the environment that I was used to. And uh, my German wasn't as excellent as I have expected of myself. My grades weren't as great in the beginning as i was used of myself because i was an excellent student before yeah. and um adapting took me um some time um and there were other russian people in in your school you were kind of like the outcast like if i wasn't i wasn't necessarily an outcast because of being um russian i was an outcast because of being foreigner in general because the school was full of german people and uh and because of the class <laughs> no. if there is still such a thing i i definitely felt that there was such a thing mm -hmm. uh, it felt a little bit like being a you know like a foreign object that was about to be expulsed out of the jelly <laughs> oh wow okay yeah because in france there's this big clap thing you know but i didn't know about germany too yeah. I think it's a very subtle thing and you only feel it uh, when you're not at the top. <laughs> you feel it more from the bottom. <laughs> Always. Always. Okay, so it, it, how long it took you to like get into the, the, the vibe, like to be like feeling adapted to, to this new situation, roughly? 
I expect to get better every day now. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, uh, really, really getting uh, used to, you know, like the roughest things that took me a year. And um, already in the eighth grade, I really came on top of my class and I had <laughs> the best grades uh, wow. out of the whole class, which I'm still very proud of. <laughs> I need I to guess. tell you about this in this podcast. <laughs> but um, uh, really, I only started feeling like like this change happened to me um two years into being in germany i suddenly felt like i was i was being this block of ice and suddenly i started melting and feeling feelings about um about this change because before i think i went unknowingly into some sort of survivor's mode where it was just like okay we're moving to a different country fine we're I'm speaking a different language great we're leaving all of our stuff behind whatevs <laughs> um also because, because you leave you left your friends and i imagine it, part of your family and stuff like that all of it uh all of that uh and um and also without really a prospect of um going back, back. for mm -hmm. for multiple um reasons <laughs> and um Do you have brother and sisters who no. travel with you at least? No. Uh, no, but um, it was it was a family. It was like uh, my mom, my dad, mm -hmm. and both of my grandparents uh, okay. who uh, who traveled with us. And so it wasn't lonely. <laughs> we uh, mm -hmm. for the first two years we lived together in like one room. Um, mm -hmm. So it was always very um, you know like um, crowded. <laughs> There wasn't <laughs> a lot of private sphere, uh, but. Um, you know, th that part I actually enjoyed. It wasn't like, oh, poor me, one room. Um, it was nice. I, yeah, I when really liked 12. it. <laughs> yeah, you really don't care. Yeah. But it wasn't it wasn't terrible at all. Um, I just think that um, I didn't give the situation any credit at all because I thought I was supposed to feel great about it. So there was no um, consideration that it might that I might have different feelings about this. Yeah. Uh, so I started when I started feeling it. It sort of came back uh, with a vengeance. It kind of kicked know. me in the groin. <laughs> That's why you wanted to be first of your class and stuff like that. Yeah, I was. I was really. Um, I was really ambitious and really, you know, uh, enthusiastic. How I can be? And uh, when when this melancholy came back about um, about these pictures from my childhood and about the memories of my friends and things that I will never experience this way. And I think everyone knows how it is because it's not just always bound to leaving a country <laughs> no. it's it, your childhood is something yeah. very singular your a lot of things are tied to it a lot of first times a lot of really nostalgic melancholic memories um and it's weird as you get older i'm telling you guys <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> you get attached to it you know like it's super precious <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's how I started feeling, and um, I it sort of was like a cutoff where I um, realized, okay, um, the innocence is sort of gone, you know, washing like, away, gone. Yeah. Um, um, so what was the plan like? Okay, so I imagine like you were saying it was going well at school. Did you know what you were, what you wanted to do in the future? What type of job or stuff like that? Or it was just doing school, and we'll see at the end. Mm, it's. Um, When I um, <clears throat> when I was a kid, I started uh, painting and drawing, but that wasn't an activity that um, I pursued more than anything else. I was studying different languages. I studied German, I studied French, I studied English. Um, also, my parents, for some reason, thought that I would be some sort of athletic genius, <laughs> which, <laughs> which I really wasn't. But they still, you know, like, fervently sent me to swimming and gymnastics and ballet and stuff like that oh. when I was a kid. Whoa. And I, I really sucked at it. Like, it's important to mention that I'm, <laughs> I'm not good so i don't i think they just wanted me to like move a little bit because mm -hmm. they realized that i'm the type of person who just like uh disappears in the book for for 12 hours so they were like at okay. least once a day you get to stand up <laughs> and do something Exercise. but um so so i wasn't i was i was very interested in art and theater and uh, music and visuals since i was a kid because that was my main connection point to my mom Uh, we always went together to um, exhibitions and we sat for hours there in the living room and uh, just looking through, you know, Renoir, Matisse, Rubel, uh, Picasso and really understanding and learning about the all of the weird expressions of uh, people 
and um it was so native to me it was it it didn't feel you know even like an activity it just felt like that's what i do with my mom <laughs> mm. and um when we came to germany and i found myself in this not so normal situation being this outcast not really having um friends always sort of not knowing what to do with myself my brain immediately went to painting so mm -hmm. i was rushing uh, home from you know uh school and then just drawing and painting for hours and hours and hours and um um do you remember what you were drawing what i was what? yeah yeah um <laughs> it was i mean it's pretty much what i'm doing now to be oh. honest it's a lot of colors it's a lot of um self-expression it's almost always some sort of self-portrait in a very abstract way which my images now are Amazing. as well <laughs> Did, do you happen to have any of them do you keep any of it mm, i think maybe yeah. at my parents um place but i I'm not very nostalgic about it, to be honest. No. I'm the type of person who loves to just like burn stuff once it's done. <laughs> wow, well, no, don't do that. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't always throw my hard drives out or anything, mm. but you know, I I just don't care about it that much. Okay. I, I not that attached when when it's done. No, not at all. I feel um, it's cathartic. I, it, it is, and yeah. also I'm not that passionate about building a legacy or anything like that. I just really want to pass the time <laughs> in with like passion and joy. But, um, anyways, back to my childhood. <laughs> uh, I was I was painting and drawing, and that was that was where I was putting my heart and soul um, into. And at some point, I also remembered that I love singing and I love music. So I um, imagined for a second that I would be Maria Callas. <laughs> so I started um, teaching myself and also with a teacher opera singing. Oh, wow. Um, and like I did it for maybe five years. And at some point I realized, okay, I'm not going to be Maria Callas. <laughs> <laughs> very disappointing. Um so, so you always look at the top. You didn't say, okay, I'm just going to be an opera singer. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to be like Alas. <laughs> that's I very analytical. You know? <laughs> it's very ambitious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, that's that's me. Uh, <laughs> ambitious and enthusiastic. That's um, good. Yeah. Um, anyways, um, that's... Um, I, I did have these fantasies uh, that I would be a painter, that I would be an artist, that I would be a singer and i i didn't have any other fantasies to be honest i just had that but i also didn't know what exactly to do with it because i wasn't very much i wasn't social i didn't have any social skills i didn't go to gatherings where people would discuss their you know professional prospects or mm -hmm. you know would like make meaningful connections with other people who also study somewhere because i was always very scared of that sort of um um meeting um i always thought that if i meet someone they would look at me and be like no you're, you're not going to be that so i was like okay i'm going to just draw at home and stay at home and do my thing um and when the time came and when it was time to decide i had all my excellent grades but no place to go <laughs> and my yeah because it's it's rare that someone is very good academically and in the meantime like super passionate about art you know usually people would choose a path you yeah. know what i mean like okay i'm gonna throw myself totally into art and fuck school or yeah. i'm gonna be like super good academically and i'm gonna do that and art will be like something on the side sometimes you know which is what my parents especially my father really wished for me um he was very passionate uh, about making his <laughs> points uh that this is something that i can do in my leisure time and mm -hmm. i need to do something safe and serious serious yeah and yeah. um, it's it's a very very like slavic parent uh treat to uh trade to to just be like do something with your life <laughs> don't don't f around <laughs> and um i felt the pressure it wasn't just like blah blah for me i really felt the pressure to um succeed in that because i felt responsible like ever since we had this you know like um um moving like seriously fleeing yeah. from um from someone um to yeah. a different country i really felt responsible to uh, deliver mm -hmm. what was uh seen for me yeah but that's a pressure that every children of immigrant has i think it's very very common definitely 100 percent. i definitely <laughs> wasn't like oh i'm so unique with my pain i think <laughs> <laughs> we all share the suffering um and um i i chose um 
you know, I just looked at the papers and I was like, well, what doesn't seem terrible? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and psychology didn't seem terrible. Um, okay. And I had the grades to do it. So I, I um, chose that and I studied it and I made my diploma and then I worked in the psychiatry <laughs> for two years. Wow. I really, I really tried. Did you enjoy the process or was it just like keeping your head down and doing what you were supposed to do? No, no, I, no, that wouldn't have been possible. I think, um, I, you know, I really love psychology. I think that psychology is very interesting and there yeah. is a lot to learn. passionate about it. Yeah, it, there is, I mean, super interesting. It, first of all, I got to learn a lot about myself, which is like the worst cliche ever, but it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I understood a lot about myself and my behavior and my, um, you know, like my own suffering and the reasons Uh, all the raison d'être <laughs> within <laughs> me um, and uh, I got to learn more about communication with other people which is something that I obviously can use now in my current job yeah. <laughs> um, and um, you know it's just a very interesting profession I yeah. just uh, didn't love it mm -hmm. but I liked it yeah And I feel like I liked it so much that I that I still have patterns within uh, myself that I would, you know, like find um, a person, and I love to watch them grow. Um, yeah. Like so you, you still do consultations. Hmm? So do you mean you still do consultations eventually, mm -hmm. or no? I just love watching people evolve. Mm -hmm. That I don't uh, do consultations with anyone, <laughs> but I just. Um, It's it's a passion of mine to um, analyze. No, I I mean I don't want I don't, don't want to be con way, I don't want to be condescending. It's no, not no. about that. It's way more about you know how if what, like when you when you have a plant and and you see every day there is a new leaf and mm -hmm. it evolves into something more and more beautiful every day. That's what I admire about humans and people in general that they have this ability. That's the most beautiful thing about humanity that. Every day there is a new petal and there is a new color and you look at it and you're like, this is beautiful. Oh, you wow. had that in you. That's incredible. That's the gist of psychology of um, practical clinical psychology to me. Mm -hmm. But like going like to a, a psychiatric environment that that must have been tough to people that I know that have gone this way. Like they waited till they were like 40, 45 before going in that in that field, you know. And uh, I can imagine there's a lot of pressure because it's it's tough to live on. It wasn't it wasn't as tough as expected. I think it was mostly interesting, and I learned a lot of things about um, humans and human suffering and human stories. The first week when I went um, to work, I was quite overwhelmed because it was not what I expected it to be. It was of course. because I was fresh from uni and I was expecting that it would be some sort of the same environment, you know, like you would have a supervisor and everyone would like baby you and mm. help you through the things. But because this is just, real life, like boom. You in just your get, face, real and life. I, I was working in a public psychiatry. It wasn't even like a private one. It was a public one on the acute station where everyone comes in who has a problem right now. You know, just like a breakdown or It's emergency, emergency, exactly. emergency. And I came in expecting all of this like supervisor <laughs> babysitter thing. <laughs> and instead you just get handed like a white coat and like a card, um, how you can let yourself in mm -hmm. and you get explained how you can handle, the, how you have to handle the doors because no one can get in or out. <laughs> so, and then they're like, well, here you go. Have fun. <laughs> and wow. you're just like, but... I, I don't know shit about, I don't know shit. Shit about stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously you have to treat um people who are like much older than you because when i started i was 24 23 and um i remember asking my you know like my predecessor i was like how do you treat people who are like who could be your dad or your mom and she was like well it's like at the bank you, you have the ability to um give them the credit card and you know what to type in there are some techniques that you have learned sure you maybe don't have their experiences but rarely do you have the same experience as the other person but you have learned certain techniques that they haven't and you have the fresh eye and the fresh perspective and i was living on what she said for <laughs> for like months because um you really get reminded a lot in that environment that you're that you ain't shit <laughs> Yeah, I think I couldn't survive this, honestly. Like, 
this is really for me it's really overwhelming you know the pain and the suffering of people and, and from the little from what i've seen from the outside and not being like a professional like you were it's, it's like really it's tough to disconnect from mm -hmm. the pain and what the people are feeling you know i didn't find it tough to disconnect at all because you realize very quickly after maybe one week of being there that you're not being very helpful to anyone um if you don't disconnect <laughs> oh, wow. yeah of course of course <laughs> because um, your only sole function there is to provide a fresh eye and a different perspective that's why you're there that's mm -hmm. how you can really help you know to um to give these people um a um you know like a safe space where they feel okay someone will help someone will give me this sort of like calm and you know real ideas and if you're there like crying with them and like uh yeah you know trigger warning slitting your wrist <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not helpful not yeah, productive of course, of course. not um so so you disconnect from it from that sort of um false empathy very quickly <laughs> um and uh you know um and the other thing is again in the first weeks you feel like you hear one terrible story after another and you're just like and they did what <laughs> and you seemed it seems to go on endlessly and then at some point you're like oh yeah I've heard that before. Oh. And in a way, um, in a way, um, the suffering becomes, I don't want to say you become immune to suffering. That's not true. But you start realizing that everyone is going through something absolutely terrible in their own unique way. And it's really not good to compare pain and be like, oh, mm. that's the worst story that I've ever heard because mm. everyone is differently sensitive to pain and Definitely. experiencing it in their, um, in their way. And it's just important to, um, you know, respect the person and try to give them as much as you can in the frame, in the little frame that you get, because it's really not a big frame. <laughs> yeah. I think at this point, everyone's probably curious to know how did you transition from that? Like, how long did that <laughs> last and what made you decide to leave? Yeah. Um, You're well, still painting at the time and drawing. I was at some point. I stopped painting. I stopped drawing uh, because I was actually going through some tough times myself mentally. I wasn't doing well for many years. For like three years, I was going through. I barely remember what I was doing. I was going to uni. I was going to um, classes. I was working two jobs <laughs> or three jobs. And I don't remember much from my life um, because the energy ceased for drawing and painting, which is usually how I save memories by making art or making it with people. And because I wasn't doing it and I was just having this like life devoid of any meaning and full of my own mental issues um, that were pretty, uh, you know, like pretty tough and pretty time and energy consuming. Um, I needed time to get out of that, which I eventually did. And uh, I remember... I was at one of the seminars for the um, education as a psychotherapist and we had an amazing um a uh, supervisor like a like a psychotherapist who explains to us how shit is done <laughs> mm. and he used me as a client he used me as a as an example and he asked me to you know evaluate my mood and how i'm doing and what my dilemma is right now and he wanted to by that he wanted to present to people how to treat Uh, patients mm. in a certain way and um it was a good moment it was good timing because i was i was like well my mood is like minus two right now um it's really not great because i just i was on the phone with you know my parents and they, they again said it's not a good thing don't transition because i was really thinking of leaving um the environment finally and starting doing something full-time uh photography um <clears throat> Because it was a hobby of mine at that moment. Mm -hmm. And my parents were like, no. no. And giving me a lot of examples of how Anton Chekhov also was just writing on the weekends and was a doctor <laughs> in the week. And, <laughs> They and, always find the right examples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. And the, it's honestly. very convincing because yeah. Chekhov is really a great writer. <laughs> But, um, you know, and and this, this doctor was like, um, or the psychotherapist, he was like, well, you know, Imagine you're going to a gas station and you want to put some gas in your car and then you press the button and stick the thing into the hole and then the only thing that comes out is just 
mod. How long do you want to keep pressing on that button to get some mod from it? And I was like, that's good example. That's a good example that he really hit differently. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, maybe two more months. <laughs> <laughs> How long is my notice? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, and. That was like magic, to be honest. That was like an incredible mantra that I really was able to believe in. And uh, I didn't, I stopped asking. I At that moment, I stopped asking and I um, I just tried it. I just tried it at some point. It took me, it took me years to convince myself to do it because I think I took up the hobby of photography in 2009 and I kept struggling with myself until... 2013 so like photography you were taking your friends it was like more like i take picture of of the stuff that i do what like how how did you start at this photography like you said it was something on the side so where did you buy your first camera and why and it's it's really dumb (laughs) i remember that i had a you know like i had a boyfriend of eight months and it was a really terrible relationship because it left me completely you know, like sad and empty and disappointed in uh, romantic relationships. And my poor brain was just struggling with the idea of it all because I was very unhappy in relationships in general. Mm. Um, and I could never find any access to other people, neither romantically nor socially nor anyhow. And um, he was interested in photography back at the time. So I was like, well, that's just as good as anything else. And maybe that will help me to create some sort of connection to this person with whom I was struggling to create a connection on any other level, even if we were together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I I took a camera that we just had at home. It was really not a good camera, just Mm -hmm. something. And um, I, I was just photographing my friends on like at night and on the street and like in nice sunny conditions whatever and um very quickly after i put these pictures online because that was a habit of mine since i was drawing i was always putting my stuff online that was how i was connecting with people um blogging you know there were always pages um where you could exhibit your stuff there was there was like um for mangas or animes there was um Animex, and then there was for painting uh, deviant art. Yeah, mm-hmm. and later there was Flickr, and mm-hmm. I yeah. always found these pages because I was such a you know like a, an outcast, just like my spacing, uh, flickering, whatever. <laughs> I was doing all of that. Well, so, I was big on MySpace. You were. Yeah. yeah. Were you Tom? <laughs> yeah, no, I wish. I wish I was. He's making a comeback. He's making fun of him being like the boss of Twitter as as so today. <laughs> yeah, because Elon Musk posted something saying, "Oh, do you want me to step out?" And Tom said, "Depends on who's taking your job." <laughs> <laughs> well, but um, I was very used to posting my stuff, and I think around that time Facebook was the thing, and yeah. I was posting my pictures on Facebook and. Um, very quickly after that, a young designer in Munich, where I was living, approached me and she was, um, um, she asked me if I want to shoot her lookbook and her campaign. And I was like, I have no idea what a lookbook is and what a campaign is because I had no affiliation to fashion at all. I didn't, I, what, I cannot say I wasn't interested or anything like that. It wasn't that pretentious. I just didn't know about it that much. So um, when when that happened, I was like, okay (laughs) because i really was at my lowest point and it couldn't get any worse and if someone asks me to just do something and i could maybe try it could only be better and you know this experience was very much a key experience in my life because um i went there and everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong like she had um we had to like chase the light at the cemetery where we were shooting because it was november and the sun went down really quickly there were five models wow. and, um, and um, there was a location and she forgot the, the key for the place oh. where there would be the lights. So we did the lights just like, you know, like in the room before the location. And I was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I w- it was like, like, That's- like being on drugs, but nice, <laughs> you know, without <laughs> the drugs. I wasn't eating, I wasn't drinking, I wasn't... Um, 
I was just like, I had like I know now what it was. I had my first adrenaline rush, so I finally found something that I could finally stuff into that you know like giant oh. abyss that is in the midst of my souls, uh, crying and desiring for something. So that was a punch in that giant void in my middle. <laughs> wow. wow. And I was I was so happy. I didn't realize that I was problem solving and you know like troubleshooting. I was just addiction. <laughs> yeah, I, I and the pictures came out really beautifully for you know like for what it was um, because I was just in my element and I was um, on that like incredible high. Um, so the, you know on that day I was like I have to do more of that. I don't believe that I've ever felt so good about myself about my place in the world about how finally people looked at me and listened to me because i didn't experience that before I not had... even with drawing and painting you didn't feel that uh well online but that's not the same yeah. mm -hmm. you know like when so when true. you have an online and offline personality that's they they are two very different things mm. i did experience it sometimes when i would be like on vacation i would draw and people would create this sort of like a uh, half circle around you and looking over your shoulder <laughs> to see what you're drawing but it's not quite the same mm -hmm. and i'm obviously like i'm a leo so i'm like in love with attention and like sun of like other people's gazes <laughs> shining on me so when i had that and people listening to me and like wanting to hear my opinion obviously i was like at your place yes <laughs> <laughs> this is for me more more of that <laughs> yeah so how did you learn from the time that you got your first camera at home till that shoot where you said you were pretty happy with the pictures did you like educate yourself how did you get like new cameras like simple things um well i i, I carried on with that shitty camera for a long long while <laughs> <laughs> i don't remember when i exchanged the camera really i mean probably when i had more money i would have exchanged it um that would be logical but with that camera i went on for a while and um i remember learning um so it was all autodidactic so i didn't go yeah. to university or a school or anything i was just doing it parallel to all of my um like jobs and seminars mm -hmm. and all of that um but i remember learning out of stubbornness because obviously like on that way when you become an artist and you start experimenting you also meet a lot of people who try to tell you how it's not done they mm -hmm. try to be like oh mm. what you do is not commercial enough mm. it's too commercial and you cannot shoot like this you cannot shoot like that you cannot do this and that there is a lot of comments going on on and offline mm -hmm. we're gonna deep in <laughs> dig into <laughs> yeah. that later <laughs> yeah. definitely but uh but um i remember that you know like there would be men <laughs> who would be like oh you cannot shoot in like broad daylight at noon because it's not really flattering lighting you cannot do that and i, I remember thinking but I'm sure I can. <laughs> like, wh what What exactly is the reason that I can't? And I remember being in love with these, like, rays of light kind of seeping through, like, sharp razor blades through mm. the window at yeah. noon. And I thought, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Why cannot I shoot that? I, I want to shoot exactly that. So I would only create concepts around those and um, find buildings that would provide this sort of, like, light rays and, and shoot at only that times. And obviously, out of these shoots, I obviously understood what people mean by saying you cannot do that because <laughs> you, um, you know, models always have to look up like this and they cannot really look into the light. But also you learn a lot of things that are unique to you and how you can treat the picture and how you can treat lighting and what a light source is. And I would use everything that would be available to me. I would use basements and cellars and um you know, like any friend that that had any sort of interest in being photographed, and um, uh, so and that's how I learned a by, lot of by doing. And learn. Oh yeah, a like, lot of training. Yeah, yeah, and you went straight into fashion, right? Well, I, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, it's I, not a bad I, thing. I, I'm just curious. no, no, no. I just, um, I, I just think it's it's funny. I don't think it's bad at all. I'm in love with fashion. I just think that. Um, I didn't really go into fashion. I think I just do me and uh, I fashion work. Fashion came to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think that I use, the best I, way. I use fashion in my work, but I I do sort of my thing for good or for worse. 
Yeah, that, that's crazy. That's uh, I would really want to do, to go there because um, before we started, we were, we were having this discussion like your art is really something special, and people were telling me like, okay, I love Elisaveta's work, but she will never do big commercial because of work is so particular you know and fashion you need to see the clothes the right color and the the, the thing you do with your art is really particular so um, what was the stage in your career be between like this shoot and what you are shooting now like where well, with the big steps and the thing how did the fashion get into you and accepted you doing you and not okay i'm good because in fashion people don't realize like sometimes brands they're gonna book a photographer because of his or her name And they're gonna make her do something totally different from what their style, you know. And mm. because they're the client, most of the time people do that. But when you're doing, I don't know, Dior, whatever, it's always your style, which is really rare in the fashion industry. I think that, first of all, I think maybe there's not enough credit given to the creatives that stand behind these brands. Um, all of these people, like, um, It's hard for me to think about fashion and how brands behave because if I learned anything from my experience in fashion is that, um, you know, every brand and every person working in this or for this brand is like a planet, like a universe. It's their own um, situation that is happening out of their own micro uh, bio cosmos and it can be very different ranging from one person to the other and it can be also very unexpected and um i think that it kind of depends on what they want in that moment and they can be very different things from one day to another and i think those are the loopholes that work for me really well <laughs> because um i'm i'm just lucky to first of all meet the right people who want exactly that sort of poetry, that sort of, you know, like horror movie or whatever that is that I'm doing. And um, people who are willing and interested to see someone grow the way how I described it earlier. They, they love to watch me grow the same way how I love watching other people grow. So they are supportive. And um, that's beautiful. That's very human. And I found that in fashion a lot. Yeah, because from the first time that we discussed like an, a year and a half or two years ago before we started work even working together mm. i think that your career just blow away which is in no it's Bye. so really, <laughs> <laughs> no in in, in, a, in a good way and I, and i mean like do you have thing that you say okay when i did this like it, it was a turning big, point yeah turning point and how did you say oh, okay i'm not gonna compromise you know the thing like when you start like going well for you is like okay i need to keep it 100 i have to be very honest here um and and also clear no one has ever asked me to compromise honestly no one was stepping on my neck and was like and now shoot a smiling woman biting in an apple <laughs> Just, i think You're people lucky then. people ask me reasonable things like yeah, of course we're shooting this bag this bag costs a lot of money mm. could you please not <laughs> shake your head so much <laughs> when you're when you're shooting this bag i think that that's very health a healthy ask um yeah, of course and um i'm i'm really happy to shoot this bag correctly because it's also you know like a, um, a question of ambition like will i manage to shoot an interesting picture with a great composition that also features a bag i'm i i have a i have a an ambition that um i don't know if if it's like purely artistic but sometimes i just or maybe it is it is actually maybe purely artistic because as an artist i ask myself can i create an image that is focused on that product and because of that it becomes an incredible image Like a challenge, mm -hmm. you mean? Yeah, yeah, it's like a it's like a challenge for myself, and I think that um, the reason why I don't experience or rarely experience this sort of you know like outside pressure is because I put all the pressure on myself. <laughs> <laughs> Get you on this one. <laughs> you see, that's my coping mechanism. <laughs> I'm my own worst enemy, so. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Um, I wanted to switch to something totally different that we were <laughs> kind of, of discussing. Like, so you growing, like growing that much in the industry and having people phoning you a lot um, on social network and stuff like that. Like, 
what's your relationship with like everybody everything around art you know the way that like artists have this relationship with their followers or whatever you want to call them do you feel like attached to it detached to it like what's your view on that it's complicated <laughs> it's very complicated because first of all i feel like until now i have um i have been going this way where i have always been very connected to my i, I say network i i i don't prefer followers because i feel like a lot of people i have really connected with in a very authentic in a very friendly way and i have to say that a lot of people from my life including my husband including uh, some of the most important relation work and uh, private relationships in my life i found them online or they found me which is crazy but it is what it is that's that's how i grew up that's that's how it worked for me so i sort of feel um you know like um deep gratitude towards these networks because things were made possible for me through the networks that once weren't possible due to like a lack of skill um lack of um confidence all of these things now i'm struggling with it more than ever um, because I feel like there are times for different things and I feel like now is my time to um focus on within more than ever w within myself and really um really listen to my inner voice in a way that I have always listened to my inner voice um but I want to tune in even even more and it's it's tougher to tune into your inner voice when you have all of these distractions. Mm -hmm. There are so much distractions. There are your colleagues doing things that you can be, you know, um, jealous and set of. Course. There are, um, uh, there are people all over the world creating incredible things that you can be, you know, wary of that you haven't, um, you didn't have this artistic idea so more on an artistic level rather than professionally speaking there are um just uh, doom holes of endless cat videos that you, <laughs> that you can fall into that's not even a joke like i yeah. i can watch these videos for forever it's really like drugs mm. honestly mm. i think it is drugs it is <laughs> drugs the way they yeah. built it yeah. is very addictive um, and um i'm you know, I'm 35. I'm sort of like sorry for wasting all that time. And um, uh, I'm not saying exchanging or connecting with my network is time wasted. That's that's not it. But it, that's just not all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I um, and so I, you know, like I, I think of finding different strategies of handling that and sort of trying to separate the one from the other almost like you you have like an egg and you're trying to separate the yellow from mm. the white and you're just juggling it <laughs> endlessly and then it falls and everything's just <laughs> <laughs> omelet <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah it's tough i think we are we were having the discussion this the relationship with the social network networks for creative is super tough because like your work is elevated by your fan base mm -hmm. but in the meantime you feel an obligation, you know, to fulfill their needs or what they like of you, you know? You? No, I don't feel that. Okay. <laughs> I know a lot of, of people feel now that Now you're way. saying it. You know? No. <laughs> it's because it's based on performance and you see like the likes, you get them as yeah. validation and you're like, okay, if they like this, I should, I should go more in that direction. I see. I didn't have that problem yet. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Okay, we just gave it to you. <laughs> no, funny enough, I've always had, um, for, with this, I always had a rather healthy attitude, I'd say. I always thought, um, because, you know, my art is always ever evolving by nature. Like I, I always try, um, to think like, you know, like one step further and how I can change what I'm doing and how I can evolve, how I can develop it. What, what kind of, you know, like new elements I can throw into the soup, mm -hmm. uh, whatever it is. Um, the soup being your creative process. Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean soup. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and by nature, 
it always looks somehow different and i've had that a lot of times um since i'm 12 or 13 i've experienced how people would react less and then suddenly enthusiastically more to what i was doing depending on whether they started understanding and connecting with that line or whether you're like that's not her or that's not what i like about her work because i have so many tentacles (laughs) Mm. of my work Speaking about your process, I'm I'm curious because you said before you're quite the nerd. You can like get lost in books and stuff like that. Mm. But you seem to be also very intuitive. What's your creative process? Do you think? I think it's exactly how you said it. It's a healthy combination of both of these, <laughs> um, you know, like ingredients. I I am very very anal about preparation, um, about uh, pre-production. There are a lot of talks going into every shoot with all of the parties there is there is a lot of talks with set design and styling and hair and makeup and if i can with the talent um because i you know like this relationship is extre- extreme extremely important to me because i think this is how you build something that is authentic and real to everyone and not just like Oh, shooting, cool, mm. shooting. I I don't want it to be a shooting. I want it to be a session, a seance, a, a thing, a, like mm-hmm. a thing that is happening to everyone right now. So it becomes a real memory. And um, and I do a lot of that. And mm-hmm. I try to prep an environment that is very standing and very real and very and that everyone understands what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. But then when we are there. I am very intuitive, as you said. Yeah. I I'm very, <clears throat> I trust this inner voice very much. There is sort of like a pull um, that you feel, and a voice that tells you just do this, this, mm-hmm. this. It's like it's like sitting in the corner. It says, "Do you see that? We have mm-hmm. to do that now." Oh wow! Well, cool. And wow. and you have to follow that because if you don't, you're doing the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. You always have to do the thing that the voice is telling you to do. Mm-hmm. Also, because did, I remember the first time that we worked together, you know, I, I was looking at your image and I, I thought that there was a lot of like Photoshop after, but people don't realize that the light, uh, you're, you're working with your husband, right? Yeah. If I'm correct. And that most of the light is created on set. Yeah, the light, the color as well. Um, and I would say that retouch is it's it is an important part of my work because still the element of foreground middle ground and background are they are like crucial they're big parts and i think it's important that the object uh, or the subject has to really pop out and that some elements become more important than others and that can be also done and enhanced in post-production but it's not what most people think um, Mm -hmm. that i'm doing (laughs) (laughs) i think that was a big thing yeah that i realized when i came on set i was like okay and you were shooting and i was looking at the monitor i was like okay oh this is already like how it's gonna look you know i wasn't expecting that and i think most people think it's a lot of post-prod you know yeah and i love that element of surprise where people look at it and they're just like oh that's (laughs) it's like it's like my me being the dolphin jumping through the hoop i love that (laughs) Mm -hmm. how how would you describe your art and what are your inspirations um, <laughs> that's a biggie <laughs> yeah <laughs> toughy um i mean uh i i'd say that my art is primarily experimental it's always an experiment mm-hmm. i always go there and there's always a question mark instead of an exc- exclamation mark it's it's always like let's see what happens if i put this and this together um and it's always about c- sort of combining um things that contradict um themselves a little bit m- sometimes more subtly and sometimes less subtly <laughs> depending <laughs> on the subject and um it's it's i think it's heavily influenced by um painting it's heavily influenced by cinema it's heavily influenced by music it's really heavily influenced by this melancholy and nostalgia that we were talking about um from my childhood it's 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 influenced and driven by the idea how people are universes and bubbles floating into in in their own respective spaces and how sometimes they can connect but most of the times they can't and there is this sort of yearning and desire to connect and but you can't <laughs> and um, the tension 
the tension and the suffering and the pain and you know the sadness coming from it it's something that i want to put in the picture and make beautiful and uh possible to endure mm-hmm. um and it's also influenced and driven by the fact that I want to remember my life and I only properly can remember my life um, when I'm taking pictures, to be honest. That's what I found out, that when I work and when I spend time with my friends, <laughs> because really most of people that I work with are my friends and people that I'm, I want to be friendly with, they... Um, when I spend time with them taking pictures, I actually remember the day and... I can access this memory as if it was some sort of golden bubble where I can just like plunge into and experience the day as if I'm having it right now, Mm -hmm. as opposed to the rest of my life where for some reason I only remember everything as if it was porridge. (laughs) (laughs) It's, it's, um, sort of sad and puzzling, but it is what it is. So I'm just trying to do as many shoots as I can. <laughs> yeah, because we, you're working like you're very close with Cecile. Yeah. The, the, there's, <laughs> the, there's a connection between you two. And she has an own, own world also. She oh, came yeah. to the podcast. You should listen to her episode. Oh, I would love to. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's really good. But uh, yeah, I, I see you doing those relationship, long relationship with lots of like the people you work with. I think it's very good. Yeah, it's it's really the gist of my life and it's um it's what I love about this. It's um uh me and Cecile and some other friends we went on a really special trip um um a couple of months ago and I've seen the the pictures like from the trip in like <laughs> Cecile's private story like waking up at 3:30 yeah. or 4 a.m. <laughs> in the car. It was hardcore but it was so worth it and we are working at these pictures since a couple of months now and it's it really, I was showing it um, earlier to uh, the studio that is going to um, create the retouching and the people said, wow, you, uh, you guys were really giving each other the emotions. It, it really shows through how important um, you are to her and vice versa. And it's, it's, yes, you tr- really it's a true. relationship between <laughs> yeah. you two. It's really is, like a bound. Uh, there is no faking. Um, yeah. It is. Um, it shows up in the pictures because it's true. And that's what I have with um, some other muses. Um, and uh, that's why the pictures work like that. Even if, you know, like even if they are over the top, even if there are vibrant colors or even if there is like a show of element, technically speaking, but there is always an emotion that uh, um, shows that I'm vulnerable and that there is no guard there. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's the toughest part, like being vulnerable in front of others. Yes. <laughs> Especially it, people you don't know. True. hundred percent. So the key is never to think about it too hard <laughs> yeah. Just do it. yeah that 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 leads me to my next question there's a word that came out a lot during this talk it's that you are very ambitious like from a very young age mm-hmm. how do you adapt your ambition to your process because you know you just said it's very like i give my best like i show vulnerability but i don't plan too much so how do you compose with that um I think, um, and I was very lucky to um, find out about that method intuitively, and I l- later learned about it um, on on a deeper level. But you know how in meditation, uh, when you meditate, you are not supposed to um, think. think think about. <laughs> well, but you're not supposed. You can think. You can have a thought, or you ha- can have a feeling. But then you are supposed to register it as Let a thought or as a feeling, and then say Mm -hmm. (laughs) bye-bye and on a some sort of intuitive level most of the times when i work even when i didn't know about these processes that much um i knew about it sort of from psychology obviously but i didn't know about it too much um i never gave my own feelings and my own thoughts um mostly my own thoughts i didn't give them too much importance in the process i when I have a thought um, during work that is uh, sort of driven by uh, false ambition, like, oh, that's not good enough or whatever, I just register it as a thought and then it just like goes. I don't let it ruin the day or the process or the experiment. Like, it's, it's, it's a thing 
that never was a big problem in my process. And that's how I handle ambition during the shoot, Mm -hmm. where I don't uh, take myself too importantly. And there is no, you know, like no ego in that game. Mm -hmm. It's all for the idea and it's all for the muse and it's all for this like big thing that we're doing. And we're just going to try as much as we can and then we'll see. Mm -hmm. But... For that your doesn't... career, uh, hmm? but for your career, is it different? Uh, that's much worse. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> because fashion is a big ego game. Yes. if we're being honest. Yeah, that's why I asked. Like how? No, that like what I just described. That obviously applies only to the shoot. I'm very lucky to have this like adrenaline rush where I don't feel anything yeah. but joy. <laughs> but um, outside of that process, well, I guess I'm not handling it very well. Like <laughs> I, I'm, I'm upset. Uh, often and uh, often I think um, about my processes and I question myself and I you know um, rethink it's I don't even really know what to say because I feel like right now I'm learning a lot Mm -hmm. Um, like in this moment and in the last months um, I'm still in the learning process of understanding what kind of artist what kind of professional artist I am and how am I going to make this um uh, long lasting without really burning myself to the ground you know <laughs> emotionally because oh. you give a lot yeah and um cross fingers i guess yeah. <laughs> we'll see <laughs> are you still painting drawing or you just stopped it i don't feel the need that much um because all of my you know, passion for color, for composition, for this sort of creation, it really goes into my photography because it all is in there. Mm-hmm. I don't have like the, the the passion for color and for color theory and for how I can mix colors. I can all I can do all of these things in my projects. And um, my interest for the humanity, it's actually much more covered by photography than it was covered by painting for me, because I actually get to work with a person in front of me as opposed to me sitting alone um, in the room and drawing something. So I'm, I'm much happier with photography than I was with painting on a human level. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like sometimes you use psychology on like models when you shoot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I, you know, to get the best of them, and like I usually wear glasses and then I just take them off and laser eyes. <laughs> and no, no, I don't use psychology on people. No, but you know what I mean. Like you've obviously learned some techniques, and you're like probably good to feel people and get people. Do you feel like that's helped you in I any think, way? I think that, you know, when you're a good psychologist, you know that outside of a session, you don't just like analyze people <laughs> and you don't uh, use techniques on them because they are not experiments. They're, they're people. people. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And um, I take that quite seriously. And I, I what I, my sp- sick special skill is, I guess, empathy, like cognitive empathy, mm-hmm. where I try to put myself in their position and um, I ask myself, how would that feel? And mm-hmm. usually... Honestly, it's not that deep. It all comes down to a lot of feedback and being um, generous with communication. Because mm-hmm. mm. um, because specifically models um, are in a very tough position on yeah, a shoot. Don't realize Everyone is looking at them. Mm. That's that's already really stressful. That's yeah. uh, It's not nothing. <laughs> mm. And they are the ones who are in front of um, the camera and they are the ones who are supposed to, you know, perform and they are the ones who are there that are going to be the end result. So there is so much pressure and usually like I'm getting older, but the girls are not getting older. <laughs> they, they just stay... Uh, now I just quoted dazed and confused. <laughs> like, uh, you know, they, they are very young people um, mm. who are supposed to figure out all these other questions in their lives. But alongside of modeling for big brands and mm. magazines, whatever, it's, it's, it's tough, it's challenging. And I think that um, seeing them as collaborators instead of objects, that's, you know, one thing mm-hmm. and um, really asking them and really meaning it when you ask them of their opinion is um, for me key. I really want to know what they like, what they don't like, how they feel. I want them to collaborate. I give a lot of feedback. I never shut up. I'm always like, yeah, that's great. Yes, work, <laughs> mama, slay, whatever. Like, <laughs> And if it's not as good, I have suggestions. I have tons of suggestions. I'm like, let's do this, let's do that. Because I... And I think that also comes through. I never see it as if 
it is solely someone's fault when something is not working because it's an experiment. Mm -hmm. So we're all just trying things out. Yeah. And that's that's my very nice, laser very eyes. healthy. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, maybe that was a weird question, but just no, no, no. It's all good, but I think that it's a very common belief about psychologists. Um, this sort of that they have laser eyes and that they are mm. like secretly analyzing you. Yeah. But it's very funny because, um, like, don't people think that psychologists also have things going on with oh, like yeah, they they're just thinking about themselves, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like everyone. <laughs> Um, you had a book last year. Uh huh. This year. This year, um, yeah. No. This year, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this year, I'm already in 2023. Um, are you working on something else, like exhibition, something you you can say? Or? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so um, in January there is um, my exhibition um, Unmasked that was already presented in Stockholm. It's mm -hmm. travel to New York and it's going to open in Fotografiska. And um, it's going to be very exciting. There are going to be talks. And um, I'm so happy that my exhibition is showing in New York, which is one of my favorite cities. Um, that really always leaves me with this yearning for more, more, more spirit of it. Mm -hmm. So that uh, is coming. And I'm going to present a really exciting personal project that I was talking about um, earlier in uh, May in Paris. That is going to be a special event. Um, And there is also another book on the way that I can't really say more about, but around autumn, we can expect a new baby. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Uh, I think we said a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you want to talk about? Mm, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, Elisabetta. It was you. lovely to have you. Thanks Thank very you much. so much for having Thank me. You. Hugs. <laughs>